And thank you for all of you for being with us here today. Um, we're going to be listening to Liliana Encinas um, on the subject of Aware and Prepare, um, about community preparedness for natural disasters, um, and specifically um, how small businesses can also be ready um, to stay in control of a situation that may feel out of control for them. So Liliana is the Public Outreach Coordinator for Santa Barbara City Fire Department and the Listos National Program Director for the Fire Services Training Institute. Um, she works pr primarily and predominantly with the Latino community as well, um, and has more than a decade of implementing outreach and engagement practices in emergency and public education. Um, She's also a mother of four. She is a CERT trainer, uh, a FEMA certified public information officer. And, and in short, she's kind of a rock star in our community. So I'm really, really grateful that um, she is able to be with us here today for this talk. Um, and also in a week's time, she will be at Cafe Con Exito, which is our um, Hispanic uh, Spanish language meetup that Weave does uh, once a month on Friday morning. So she will be doing an abbreviated version um, of this there as well. So Liliana, thank you so much um, for supporting Weave and supporting our community with, with everything that you're doing. So without much more, I will go over to you. Well, thank you, Nikki. That was such a great introduction. <laughs> now I feel all excited this morning. Well, thank you all. Can, first of all, can everybody heal, hear me clearly? Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, a few minutes into my presentation, I will make the announcement that we do have interpretation available. And so I am going to share my screen and just give me a thumbs up if you are able to see it. Yes, we're good. All right. Okay, so I'm going to get us started with um, disaster preparedness and I'm sure some of you uh, or maybe most of you are, uh, this is not a new topic, right, but it's always nice to review uh, what we know, what we think we know, and then better our skill sets for preparedness. So um, I'm the public outreach coordinator here for Santa Barbara City Fire Department. I've been with the department for about eight years. Um, I've been involved with the Wear and Prepare for a decade now, uh, uh, starting as a public outreach uh, person as well for Latino initiatives, and then uh, just kind of leading uh, the Listos program, which is a, a public education program under Aware and Prepare. And we'll talk a little more about Aware and Prepare towards the end of the presentation. But for now, we're going to get us started with just disaster and emergency you know, terminology. And so we're going to cover our hazards, which most of you are very familiar with. If you're from the area, we're going to talk about how we can be better prepared the types of community trainings that are available to us. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about business continuity because that's a very important uh, subject when we talk about preparedness. And then we'll leave it for Q&A at the end. And so we're gonna get us started with the difference between an emergency and a disaster. And I always start my conversations like this, asking you, do you believe there's a difference? Do you know the difference between the one and the other? So if anybody wants to share it on the chat, Nikki, if you could help me out with the chat because I don't have access to the chat from here, but if anybody wants to put it on there, what's the difference between an emergency and a disaster? Everyone's very quiet this morning. Everybody's quiet? No, don't be quiet. This is a wonderful topic. Let's get engaged. Stephanie says disaster can be ongoing. Okay, good. Anyone else? Disaster is a severe outcome after the emergency occurs. Okay. Yes, we're on the right track, definitely. Well, you're right. There's a, there is a difference between one and the other. And the, dif the main difference is the impact of each one. And so, the emergency obviously is unforeseen, right? Uh, we, but for the emergency, we usually have the resources to attend to it. If there's an emergency, if one house is burning uh, down, yes, we have the resources to put it out. However, the impact on the family that lived on that house that was burned is a disaster, right? Because it's the impact to them. So that's how we kind of uh, 
define the difference between one and the other, right? It's the impact of it. And so emergencies are, you know, something that, that happens. We can go to the emergency room if it's something, you know, with healthcare, healthcare, something we need to attend to. If there's a, a fire uh, and there's enough personnel to put it out, that's considered an emergency. But a disaster is more of a widespread destruction, right? And we usually relate disasters to, you know, natural phenomenon. So uh, either uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, you know, debris flow, that kind of um, kind of scene is what we see as a disaster. But the example I gave you right now, which is a house burning down for a family that had everything they owned, everything uh, they ever possessed in that house is a disaster to them because it's the, it's the, the magnitude of that impact. And so now that we know the difference between one and the other, we're going to talk about kind of what happens in our region. And I know that we do have folks, not only from Santa Barbara County, but we have Ventura County, San Luis Obispo County, and the multiple jurisdictions within each county. Um, and so what hazards have we seen just in the past two and a half years? I mean, I think we've seen quite a, quite a few, right? Um, and so feel free, Nikki, to interrupt me if people put stuff on the chat. But but you might have guessed it, right? Wildfires is the most common one that we have. We have so many wildfires. And I just put a few examples here for you, like the K fire, Jesusita, the Thomas fire, and then most recently the Loma fire. So um, the this happens, right? It happens. We are we are kind of in that mindset that we're in a year-long, um, you know, uh, wildfire weather. We don't say you know, oh, in January, we're not going to get any wildfires, right? Because it's not the, it's not the time of the year. Well, no, that kind of has transitioned to a year long, but however, when we have sundowner winds, when we have the Santa Ana winds, it increases the potential of having these wildfires. That's why we have more messaging go out uh, during the summer and the beginning of, of the fall um, because of the weather patter patterns. And so I included here, and I hope this is, you know, <laughs> this is visible to you, and I apologize if it's too small, but this is actually a map that we have here uh, in our county of the history of the fires by decade. And it's by color, right? And so you can see, and I'm going to just point it out with my uh, mouse, but you can see the impact uh, of the fires in 2010, which is the, the dark orange, right? And, and how many fires we had in the 2000s are the ones in green, the dark green. And so you can clearly see see that in the past uh, in the past two decades it, it has increased quite a bit right and we have uh, you know quite a bit of fires and the the amount of um, terrain that these fires cover now is a lot more than when it used to be before the 2000s like in the 90s or the 80s and so this actually you know the picture doesn't do a lot of justice to it but if you see this map and it's like big on one of our walls it's quite impactful um, how these fires had have impacted our community and so we do have wildfire preparedness. We have our Ready, Set, Go program, which most, uh, I, I want to say all of the fire departments or special districts or um, uh, just, you know, fire prevention has this program, which is wildfire preparedness. So people that live in these areas that are prone to wildfires should have, you know, their Ready, Set, Go down to, you know, perfection, right? And and the way that we usually tell you is if you're kind of thinking, I don't know if I'm in a wildfire zone, I don't know, you still have to prepare because it impacts your community regardless, right? So you still have to prepare, but you have to remember just people and pets, you know, important document papers, which is, we call it the six Ps, important documents, prescriptions, you know, pictures, computers, and anything that we call plastic, like, you know, credit cards, cash, that kind of stuff. And so if you're prepared, and this is what I usually tell people, if you're prepared for an earthquake, you're pretty much prepared for any other disaster, including a wildfire. The difference is that with wildfires, you have to have a really good, robust evacuation and communication plan. 
because that's the impact, right? The roads get impacted. You might not be able to get back to your home, et cetera. So I do encourage you to get familiar with your Ready, Set, Go program wherever you live. Uh, if you're in the Santa Barbara um, County area, both fi uh, county fire and the cities have their Ready, Set, Go programs. And they're just, you know, very simple brochures. And I have one here so you guys can see it. Um, but it's very simple, you know, just a few pages and it gives you like a plan. You can write in it. It's like a workbook, like a little workbook where you can get your plan um, in there. And then of course we've had floods, right? We've had microbursts and I'm sure you all remember this microburst, right? That happened uh, a few years ago that just all of a sudden, right? It was like a Armageddon here in um, State Street and the beaches and these winds. And, you know, so we do have this, this, these weather patterns that are just strange, but they happen and they impact us and they impact our businesses too. Right. And so we always have to keep thinking of it impacts our families it impacts our workplace. It impacts us in all levels. And then of, of course, earthquakes, right. This is uh, something that we're always training for. I'm always, uh, educating folks on, on earthquake preparedness. And just in the past week alone, we've seen a lot of activity uh, of earthquakes um, and, and quite um, more significant in the Richter scale. So we did have uh, over a 5.2s. Uh, and, and that tells us that there's movement, right? We live in an active area and we are expecting a big earthquake, but we're not going to be just thinking of, oh, the big one's going to hit us. No, because we have a lot of faults. We have a lot of uh, earthquakes that could possibly happen. And so I included this picture in this, and I apologize, but this was from when I sent the, the presentation to Nikki, right? But if you actually, if you look up recent earthquakes of California, it's going to update this picture for you. Uh, and it shows you the movement, right? Uh, of the last week, the last day, the last hour. And it tells you kind of how, how we're doing in our region. We are right around here, right? And usually we don't have a lot of movement. And people tell me, well, um, you know, we, well, what does that mean? Does it mean like we're good or, well, no, it means that uh, we we're expecting one. Uh, we don't know when, but we're expecting one because we haven't had a lot of seismic movement and that's actually not good, right? And so, we, we do encourage folks to be prepared, prepare like if we're going to get that big earthquake, uh, but prepare now um, because we never know. And then, of course, the hazardous materials. We do have transportation incidents. We have uh, lots of impacts. So you guys all know that in the winter months, when the grapevine closes, what happens to our freeway? Highly impacted, right? It's a lot of traffic and we get all those folks, you know, going around and coming through our freeway. So there is impact to us. And uh, here's some incidents of um, the Metrolink. This happened in um, in LA, between LA and, and over here. And this impacted us because it was right towards the end of our fiestas. Um, and so we it, it impacted us in an economic way, right? Because we didn't have a lot of folks come down and, and visit us around that time. And then we've had uh, hazardous materials that have spilled on the free freeway and have you know impacted our creeks and anyway. So there, this does happen, and and it doesn't mean that uh, well, what are we going to do about it? We can't do anything about these incidents. Well, no, but you have to have a plan, right? Because we have one freeway, and so if you're a commuter, or if you use it. Um, to go to and from work or wherever you're going, you have to have a plan in case that doesn't that doesn't happen. And then of course, tsunamis, slides, oil spills, and everything else that comes with it, right? So this is a picture from La Conchita uh, that happened um, back in 2005, I think it was, 2005, 2004 was La Conchita. No, it's the fire. Nikki, Nikki, you're making me doubt my 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 historic knowledge. 2005, and then we do we did have uh, the debris flow uh, that happened in January of 2018. We have Isla Vista riots that occurred uh, a few decades ago, the refugio oil spill, and then uh, you know the tsunamis. So um, some po folks are like, what? We, we get tsunamis? Yes, we could get tsunamis. And actually, if you look around your 
surroundings, when you're, you know, enjoying beautiful Cabr uh, Cabrillo Road, uh, you can actually see the tsunami hazard signs all over. And when you're exiting these tsunami areas, tsunami hazard areas. So that's another thing. We have to be quite aware of our surroundings. And uh, if there's an earthquake significant um, enough that it moves you, right, it kind of throws you off your feet, you have to get to high ground because most likely there is going to be a tsunami that follows. And then we have this B here. You're probably like, Liliana, why did you put a B there for hazards? And so this is the uh, African ice bee. And so she feasts on honeybees. And so when we had plagues, I think, I don't remember the exact date, but um, it impacted our crops quite a bit. And so we do have a lot of agricultural um, uh, you know, fields up in, in, in the north part of our county. And so when something like this happens, well, it impacts our, our infrastructure that we don't have, you know, our farmer's markets or, or anything like that. And so I wanted to include that too. And then, of course, the pandemic influence. We always included this in our trainings. And, uh, you know, prior to COVID, we were always like, you know, this could happen. And influence is a huge deal, right? And an epidemic is when it's, you know, an increase in your area, right? And in your region. But then an, a pandemic is when it's worldwide. And we've seen this with influenza. And we had, you know, a vaccine. And every year we tell you, you know, put on that vaccine to prevent it from becoming a pandemic or, or an epidemic. Uh, and then this came along, right? And so then COVID came and it's like, pff, just threw everything off the charts and our preparedness was kind of switched a little. And so we have to continue being prepared, right? Um, because this is just one pandemic for one virus. Uh, we've heard it over and over again from our experts uh, like Dr. Fitzgibbons that says, this is not gonna be our last pandemic. And so we have to make sure that we're prepared and, and, and learn from this experience on how we can either avoid that, you know, or, you know, just kind of believe in science, right? <laughs> no, that sounds silly, but um, there, there's a reason why there's a vaccine and why we want to stop the spread of it. And um, therefore, the variants and, and the Delta variant that's been impacted, impacting our community. So let's continue to be safe, right? Wear a mask when we're asked to. Uh, get our vaccine as soon as we can. Let's continue washing our hands. If COVID taught us anything was that we need to better our hygiene. Uh, uh, and so washing our hands, you know, people were taught to wash their hands again. So that's something that we need to learn from this. And then of course, one hazard that ha kind of has been the, the buzz is the, the, the public safety power shot offs. And this is very pertinent to your businesses, right? This is something that is definitely going to impact you. And um, so what you need to learn about the public safety power shut offs is how are you going to get notified? How is it going to impact you? And how are you going to be prepared for it? It basically comes down to those three steps. And so make sure that whoever your provider is, your power company is, uh, if it's uh, Southern California Edison or if it's PG&E, that you are notified. There's uh, an app, uh, SE has an app that you put on your phone and it's called like My SEE and it notifies you if there's any planned uh, public safety shutoffs, um, anything that has to do with your account. So make sure that one, you know where to get the information and that you get it. And then how is it gonna impact you? Do you rely on medical devices? Do you need medication that needs to be refrigerated? Um, you know, what, what is your family like? Like, do you have, you know, young children? Do you have elders? Do you, you know, have an electric vehicle? Uh, you know, just to, you have to really think about how this is going to impact you because it could last as little as hours, but it could last up to days. And so that's why it's so important for us to plan and, uh, and prepare for it. And, and it all comes down to always writing a plan, right? And you're going to hear me say that over and over again, just to have a plan, have a plan at home, have a plan with your family, in your place of employment. If you're a business owner, have a plan, have a plan. And so where do you fit in as a community member? And we're, we're going to talk about community members now, and then we're going to move on into like actual business. What, what's your role as a business? But as a community member, you have to take responsibility for yourself. I hear from a lot of people that they're like, oh, well, you know, the firefighters are going to be there and the paramedics, and we have a ton of first responders and we do awesome with the fire. So an earthquake, why is it different? Well, because remember what we talked about emergency and disaster? 
when it's a disaster, we're not going to have the resources to attend to every single resident in our county. We're not. And so people have to take responsibility for themselves, need to have a plan, need to have non-perishable food, need to have water, need to have everything they need, right, to to stay afloat for the, at least five days. We say three to five days, but five days should be the least. And really creating that plan for you and your family before it happens. So you can lessen the impact because you already kind of had talked about it. And so we say that it's about four steps, right? To get you prepared. And so one is having your supplies, what we call a go kit, having a plan being informed, and then getting training. So if you do these four things, you are good to go. It doesn't mean that it's not going to impact you, right? It doesn't mean that the earthquake is not going to get to you or, um, you know, the wildfire. No. But what it means is that you actually are going to have a plan to act rather than react. And so that's where we want to get to. So just some example, and you probably already know this, so we're just reviewing this on, on your emergency supplies, right? Have at least a three to five day of water supplies. We say five days in reality, one gallon per person per day. Uh, Non-perishable food, like, you know, canned food, dried goods, um, anything that's, that, that's fit for you and your family's needs. So don't buy those prepackaged uh, emergency kits because they do sell them. Well, I shouldn't say don't buy it, but I wish I should say consider creating your own because it's according to what your needs are. Those pre-packaged ones are wonderful, but they really are not fit for a family with different needs. They're not. And then, of course, include your can opener and what you need on your supplies. You know, in your ready kit, you should consider having flashlights, batteries, first aid kits, extra clothing, sturdy shoes, blankets, cash, and a, a hand cramped or battery operated radio. And because, and we're going to talk about this a little more, but you have to stay informed, right? If there's evacuations, if there's warnings, if there's alerts, whatever it is, you need to know what's going on. And so we do have several radio stations, uh, at least here in Santa Barbara County, that will operate uh, during a disaster and have those um you know, um, agreements with our County Office of Emergency Management to stay on during a disaster. And for example, in Spanish language, it's uh, Radio Ronco en la Musical, which is two radio stations that we have here down south, that they stay operating, of course, if they're not highly impacted during that disaster. And then important documents, right? And what I tell folks is just make copies if you have you know, pictures of that have sentimental value. If you have your, you know, insurances, whatever it is, just make, scan it and put it up in a cloud, in a flash drive, wherever, but just keep it in a safe place and in one location that you can access it. Because remember, if there's a wildfire you, in, in your house is impacted, you're not going to be able to go back there. And so you need to prove that you live there. You need to have a proof of ID, right? That it's you. So all of that, you need to have access to it. And then making a plan, right? Developing a plan with your family. We talk about, you know, having evacuation routes, meeting places, and communication. And that's a huge one because folks forget that communication is one of the first things that fails in a disaster. And so we rely a lot on our cell phones. We rely a lot on, uh, you know, we don't even know the number and we're like, call mom, you know, call dad. And, and, and if I ask you the number, do you know the number? No, right? And so what happens if you, you're out of battery on your phone, you don't know the number, how are you gonna communicate with that person that's out of the area that hasn't been impacted? How are you gonna tell your, let's say your daughter that's on the other side of town, but you can't communicate because you know the lines are getting through, how is she gonna know you're okay? How, does she, how is she gonna know where you're gonna meet or if your meeting place is safe? You need that out of area contact. And so you need to know these numbers, either memorize them or write them down. Uh, and then sharing your plan with whoever you want to share it, but don't keep it to yourself. Your whole family needs to know the plan. Uh, your neighbors maybe need to know the plan as well. And uh, just some examples of how you can make a plan. This is, um, you know, 
we, we, what I, I joke around when we do the, the employee orientations and I tell them we have like everything so, uh, you know, detailed when we go to work, we know what time we leave. We know that if we leave like two minutes after we're going to catch this, you know, um, traffic here, this stoplight over here, we already have that already calculated because we're always kind of like on autopilot. So I always encourage our city employees and I say, well, when you go home today, take a different route. If you're used to taking that same route all the time, take a different one, challenge yourself. How can you get to and from work in a different way, right? Or, or to the childcare when you pick up your kids or the school or, or wherever you're going. And then I wanted to include some evacuation terminology. So you understand when, when you're creating your plan, what this means. A lot of folks don't understand the difference between our, our terminology. And so remember that uh, an order is the immediate threat to life. So an order is, is uh, mandatory, right? You have to leave the area. And so that's what an evacuation order is. You have to leave now. And if you don't do so, you're putting your life at risk, but also the first responders' life at risk. An evacuation warning is the potential, right? The, the threat to life or property. And so those that require more time to get ready to evacuate, you know, to evacuate their pets or livestock or whatever they have, they should leave at that moment. And uh, a warning uh, can become an order. And we've seen that a lot, um, but always leave if you feel unsafe. Some people tell me, well, we were waiting for the order, you know? And so I'm like, no, if you feel unsafe, you get out of there, right? You don't have to wait um, unless they're telling you to shelter in place, which is the next one, then that's different, right? But if you feel unsafe and you're in a warning zone, then just leave because it may become an order. And shelter in place is just stay in the current location or the safest location nearby a building or a place that's not going to burn, right? Some people think of shelter in place, well, I'm going to stay right where I am at and just, you know, cover and hold on. Well, no, no, you have to find a safe place where you're going to stay, right? That's why it's called shelter in that place. Of course, ideally, that shelter in place could be our home, right? Because we already have it, have it prepared, but it can be your place of work. That could be your shelter, uh, your shelter in place. So do you have the resources you need? Do you have enough water? If you're a business and you have employees, is there water there? Is there, you know, a, a first aid kit? Is there non-perishable food? Is there, if they have to shelter in place there for a while, are you capable of doing that? And then when an evacuation order is lifted, that's kind of like the formal announcement that, uh, that the area that was under evacuation is kind of clear. Um, the hard closure is close to all traffic except fire and law enforcement. Soft closure is that it's close to all traffic except fire and law and the critical incident resources. So you might have public works or those types of, of uh, agencies when it's a soft closure. Uh, resident only closure. This is an important one because this is a soft closure, but it allows residents and government agencies to, to assist in the response. However, if you cannot prove that you live there, if you don't have a proof of residency, you cannot access it. No matter how many times you tell them that I live right there, that's my house. Well, you need to prove that. And so that's why it's so important to have our documents in order. And then staying informed, right? This is step three. This is a huge one because um, we, we rely so much on social media now that we forget that sometimes they're not verified sources of information. Sometimes it's a he said, she said, and I, you know, oh, they're not letting us, you know, repopulate. We've been evacuated for, well, no, the repopulation order was done a long time ago, right? Because you're reading it on social media and you're not getting the, you know, the, the right information, then that happens. And so make sure that you're signed up to receive alerts uh, with, um, Ready SPC um, or text alerts with Nixle through the triple eight triple seven, and then you text your zip code and you can receive alerts on your phones, KYT News or whatever your local news station is. Radio, if you rely on radio, you can also use that. Um, you can have satellite phones. Uh, just making sure that there's that these resources are verifiable uh, sources of information. That's what's most important. And here's the readysbc.org site. Most of you, I think, are familiar with this. There was quite a, a push on this when the Thomas fire occurred. 
So there's a button there that says register for alerts and this, this red button right here, right? You click on it and it takes you to a different tab where you put your information and then you're signed up. And then our last step is get training, right? We offer free training. And if you're in, uh, in, for example, the city of Santa Barbara, we have cert trainings, we have least those trainings that are ongoing year long and they're completely free. With COVID, we did have to modify that and go to uh, you know, a, a platform like a Zoom platform for um, our Listos program, but it's still available. And with CERT, we did have to do kind of a hybrid program as well. Um, but it, everything's, I hope, right, that everything's gonna go back to in-person training uh, in the fall. So if you are interested in getting trained, and these are trainings that uh, just kind of give you, Listos gives you the basics of being prepared at home. So in Individual, individual and family preparedness. And CERT is more of a community response training where it teaches you, you know, from light search and rescue to fire extinguishing to um, terrorism. I mean, it covers a lot of topics and I'm happy to share more information on, on the trainings that we offer. But these programs are actually national programs. So they're all over the place. So no matter what county you're representing today, you most likely have a CERT and a listos in your area. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about business continuity. And Nikki, how am I doing on time? You are perfect. Okay, perfect, all right. I don't wanna to take too long because I could talk disaster forever. Okay, so business continuity. Um, so what happens after a business interruption, right? If there's property damage, right? After the disaster, we already know the difference between an emergency and a disaster. Do you have a remote location? Uh, will you have loss of employees? So you have to kind of think of this and Nikki's going to cover it a little bit more into detail um, when I'm done with my portion of the presentation, but you really have to think. And with COVID, I think we, we were all put in that place, right? Where, where we did, we had no option, you know, a remote location maybe was where we had to go. And, and most businesses did not survive because of, of how it impacted them. And so uh, identifying and prioritizing. So who do you get your information from? Are you asking the right questions? And this is, um, um, for example, we were just having a conversation this morning about OSHA, right? And how um, they kind of tell you, right? Well, how is, what's the safest way in your place of employment, uh, for example, right now with COVID. And so you have to make sure that you, you know where your information's coming from, if it's verifiable information, and that you're asking the right questions, right? How would you keep that task going if it was interrupted for eight hours, for 20 hours, for three days, or for weeks, right? If we're talking about um, an impact, like for example, the debris flow, do you guys remember how long it was that that freeway was closed um, and how the impact, the, you know, the severe impact to our community? So you have to kind of think about that. And then categorizing your business processes. So there's three levels, kind of, this is how we put it in, in emergency services, but there's a necessary, significant, and a minor, meaning that the necessary is a function that cannot be replaced by manual method. Uh, significant, is, significant is the function that can be performed manually for a brief period of time, and then minor that it can be interrupted for an extended period of time. So when you talk about your business and the planning for your business, you have to keep that in mind. And then, of course, the tolerance, right, which is your ability to cope with the interruption uh, and the length of interruption, uh, the time of day, the time of year. What is your business like, right? If it happens during the summer and you're a business that relies a lot on tourism and, you know, we get impacted, our railroads or our freeway gets impacted, then how is that going to reflect on your business? And then starting the plan. And so we have four elements of emergency response plans, which is one is prevention, right? Which is where you identify your risks, you implement preventative measures, you assess needs and resources, and then you identify stakeholders. So that's kind of the first element. The second element is preparedness. So you work with community partners to develop emergency management policies and procedures. You clarify roles, responsibilities, provide training, you conduct drills and exercises, because remember that folks don't do what they learn, they do what they practice. And so that's where we wanna get our community to. Element three would be response, which is now you're activating your plan. 
follow the leader, document actions, and then the debriefing. This is kind of like you're in that response mode. And then lastly, it's recovery. So your mental health, right? Your emotional recovery from uh, how your business was impacted. Uh, you recognize that recovery is an ongoing process, right? Some, sometimes disasters have a recovery that lasts for years, even decades, right? Uh, we see that with Puerto Rico right now. Emphasize the importance of appropriate interventions, and then of course, business recovery. So those are kind of like the four elements that you, you need to have in your emergency response plans. And then writing your plan, right? So start with a checklist. If, you're, if you don't have this yet, just start with a checklist, right? What, what is the mission of your business? What are your goals, your objectives? Um, what types of emergencies could you, you know, foresee that could happen in your, um, in your business? Do you have a response plan? Has that been updated since COVID? Um, or you know, maybe you have a pre-COVID uh, plan and it was severely uh, impacted with COVID. So now you have to really think about that. You have less employees, uh, you have remote as an option maybe now, and then facilities, right? And property uh, layout maps. And so your employee contact information, remember I talked about communication and how that's always uh, a huge uh, impact when there's a disaster. So making sure you, you have that um, information, uh, having your contacts like OSHA, police, fire, all of that in your plans, agreements with outside sources, um, insurance policies, media relations, and uh, an alternate facility if it comes to that. And so uh, testing your plan really, uh, it comes down to that practice, right? What we tell you is conduct exercises and drills and put your plan, um, uh, you know, into practice that way with, you know, maybe multi-agencies or uh, with other nonprofits that are similar or uh, whatever it is that your network is comprised of, uh, make sure that you practice that. And then uh, always be open to improving your plan. And just remember that preparedness is, is a continual process, right? Not because you have a ready kit and you're, uh, your plan and oh I'm good I'm 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 ready like that's where it stops no 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 it it keeps going it's not a one time deal so um, we want to make sure that you're acting and not reacting right and then it it also gonna it's gonna shorten the 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 response time and the recovery and so it what we want you to do is to lessen that impact of that disaster it's gonna happen any other way but how can you lessen the impact and so. Um, you know, incorporate your training, incorporate your personal experience, your lessons learned, and, and then, you know, you're going to be better prepared. So in summary, right, uh, there's no one size fits all approach. So you've seen that, I think, and because of the businesses that you have or your unique family's needs, uh, we all have to prepare accordingly. And, uh, and training and practice are essential for the successful implementation of crisis response plans and your individual disaster preparedness, right? Uh, all employees should be trained on appropriate crisis response policies in your businesses and your procedures. I suggest that you conduct at least twice a year drills where you are either talking about disaster preparedness uh, or an emergency or whatever it is, but I do recommend that you do that at least twice, twice a year. And uh, us here at the fire department, we're able to assist you. So we do get um, some folks that reach out and can you evaluate our you know, earthquake drill? Can you evaluate our, our fire drill or can you, you know, come and inspect or do whatnot? We have those services available. And, and as you can see, emergency management is on multiple levels, right? Businesses, local, federal, personal. I mean, you, 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 you mentioned it. I mean, it's, we have to talk about emergency management because it's something that's there. So here's just some resources for you. Um, and I, I believe most of you are familiar, right, with the Red Cross. We have the VOAD, Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters. We have VOAD here in Santa Barbara County. So I encourage you to be part of that VOAD if you are interested. Um, we have uh, SB Care. We have uh, uh, our city OES Facebook or our social media platforms have information as well. We have the Santa Barbara Response Network that uh, focuses on, on mental health and, and well-being. We have our Ready SBC that uh, 
um, kind of gives us um, information about multi-hazard and, and how to be prepared. We have Recovery Ready, which is another site in, in Santa Barbara County that also has information. We have our Listo site, which is a cfalistos.org for um, individual and family preparedness. And then of course, Cal OSHA, public health. And then we have something called Mi Vida Mi Voz. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but this is a community-based platform of information that um, it, it kind of consolidates all of the resources that we have in our community into one platform. And it has, uh, you know, from financial support, uh, it has, uh, you know, now with COVID, like all of the information on evictions and on uh, all of these different um, information resources that are out there, it kind of brings them all together and it's a great platform. So that's maybe that me was. And of course, Aware and Prepare. So Aware and Prepare started here over a decade ago, right? And it was a, it was a public private partnership um, that was precisely there to build resiliency here in Santa Barbara County. And so Aware and Prepare is, is still strong and going. And I, if we have Barbara Anderson on, so I can uh, let her speak a little bit more about what Aware and Prepare offers, who we are and, and, and how you can be part of it. So that ends my presentation. Does anyone have any questions, comments before I uh, let Nikki take over? We did have a question um, in the chat. Um, in terms of you were you were speaking about some of the emergency the like the emergency kit and some of the key documents or maybe copies of those key documents. Are those the type of thing that should be kept in your house or should you keep a set in your car or both? Can you speak to that? Well, um, yes, everywhere. So in your house, definitely, right? But if we have a wildfire and you can't go back to your house, how are you going to access them? That's why I think it's good that you do have your documents in one place in your home, but that you also have a backup you know, uh, saved on a cloud, on a flash drive, somewhere where you can access it in case you can't go back home. And so remember what I mentioned about that house uh, burning down and, and, and people, you know, if you have it there, then that's it. That's your only copy. So make sure you have those backups everywhere you can. It's like a ready kit. Have a ready kit at home. Have one in your vehicle. Have one in your office, wherever you can, because you never know where you're going to be when that disaster strikes. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, and actually, Barbara, do you want to just speak a little bit to Aware and Prepare while I transition over to the other slide in a second? Absolutely. I think, you know, Liliana spoke to our history really well, and we are evolving just like every organization to adapt to the new environment that we're in, which is sustained disaster and emergency response while anticipating additional natural disasters, especially with the wildfire threat that we're facing in our region this year. Um, it really is an opportunity for us to meet organizations and individuals where they're at. You know, we really try to make preparedness approachable. It, it can seem overwhelming, um, but like Liliana did so perfectly is break it down into these really uh, useful and productive steps. So taking those steps, learning with your organization, especially with your leadership team, looking at what you can do as an entrepreneur, as a small business, there are critical steps that you need to put in place no matter what. And, and I know that we've helped you through that process of insurance and business planning and continuity of business planning, but looking at if you are not prepared then you, and your employees are not prepared, then you're not able to operate your business at all. So taking these individual preparedness steps I think is the easiest and best thing that you can do right now. And then we can always help and support you as an organization and a business to do those little bit more comprehensive planning processes. So we want to make it approachable. We're always here for you. Um, Aware and Prepare um, through Fire Services Training Institute offers organizational business continuity planning, disaster preparedness training. And like Liliana is saying, all of the training is accessible and, and for free and no charge. So we do um, apply for grants both locally and statewide to make sure that we're subsidizing those trainings so they're available to everyone. Thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being on. Liliana, do you have any other um, comments before we just talk more specifically about um, no, uh, I just wanted two recommendations. Uh, so if I spoke for like the past 30 minutes and you're like, oh, yeah, that's bombarding me. So if you can do anything today is fill your tank of gas, put your keys 
where you know you're going to find them when you get home and take an alternate route home and keep your phone charged too. So if you can do that today, you're making a huge difference in the impact that the disaster will have on you. So I'll leave you with those simple steps. But if you want to go further, you know where to find me and I'm happy to help you. <laughs> Thank you, Liliana. So I just wanted to um, go over some of the specifics for small businesses. Um, as Liliana said, it's all about planning um, and it's all about P's. I didn't realize that there were going to be six P's in the in the first one. And I have three P's for you here as well. So um, let's break them down into people, place and process. So people is is really like who, you know, who works for you? Who are you able to um, contact them? Do you know their um, phone numbers, um, email addresses, residential addresses? You know, if something happens, are you going to be able to get in touch with your employees um, and contact them and, and check in with them? Um, in terms of um, determining like who you need to make a plan to determine who is going to reach out to maybe which group, which department of people, um, which location. Um, but you really want to have a plan to be able to communicate with your nearest and dearest um, family, friends and employees. And also that may extend into key clients and key vendors. So to be sure that you have the contact information for your key clients and your key vendors um, in a in a in a format that's easy for you to access. Um, in terms of place, you know, what would be the alternate place of work if you are unable to get to your normal place of work? And, you know, as Liliana said, with COVID, we have naturally gravitated back to our homes um, as the alternate place of work, but maybe that isn't a possibility either. So um, just taking the time to determine, you know, if there's an alternate office site, um, perhaps there's a, a satellite um, co-working space, um, perhaps there's a hotel that you can identify, um, where would you set up shop um, if you weren't able to open up in your normal place of business or return to your normal place of business? And similarly, thinking a little you know, broad, more broadly, um, if you have supplies coming in, um, if you have inventory stored on site, what are you going to be doing to mitigate you know, those um, assets of your business? So are you able to um, have things delivered to an alternate site? Are you able to move your inventory to an alternate site? So it's really considering that for your business. Um, what are the specifics to your place of business and what would be your alternates if you couldn't get there um, or operate there for you know, a day or three days or, or longer? Um, and then in terms of processes, so it's really, again, looking at the communication, um, what would be the alternative communication channels um, in terms of um, um, supply chain? Um, are you able to reach out to your vendors? Um, are you able to source things from a different place? You know, if you're not able to get a certain product for a period of time, how is that going to impact your business and what can you mitigate? Um, are you still able to take sales? Are you able to take sales online um, or in a different way to how you've normally been doing that? Um, and then things like accounting and records, where are your records kept? Um, are they in the cloud? Are they on a desktop um, in a location? Are you able to get a backup for that location? Um, maybe take those computers off site, take the disk drives off site. Are you doing that on a regular basis? So I'm listing a lot of things. And the, but the thing is that everything is going to be specific to you and your business. Um, we do have a, a checklist that we like to share with our clients. Um, I have that available as a PDF and I will be sending that out. Um, with the, the recording from today, um, just email me if you want a copy of that and you don't already get it, but it can be a good starting place um, because it can be overwhelming to think about all these things for the first time. So this checklist gives you an opportunity to just methodically go through some of these things that we've been talking about and consider them for your own business. Um, and finally, the, the really big thing to talk about is insurance coverage. Um, and, you know, the short, the short answer to that is um, get yourself a, a good insurance agent that you like and trust and that you feel is interested in your business. Um, and how do they show their, their interest? They're, they're asking relevant questions about your business. Um, they're checking in with you on a regular basis. They're making suggestions that are kind of 
um, you know, thoughtful um, and relevant for you and your business. So, um, you know, every small business owner should have a minimum comprehensive small business policy. Um, but, you know, some other things to consider is if you're operating your business out of your home, how does that impact your small business policy? And do you need to think about some other policy, um, like an additional policy that would specifically cover the business assets and the business um, aspects of what you're doing? And we found that during some of the recent disasters that people had a home insurance policy, but that wouldn't cover, say, the loss of a printer or a computer that they were using for their business. So, again, be very specific about what your insurance needs are with an agent. Um, it's important that you consider getting business interruption insurance if that is relevant for you and your business. That will mean that um, if your business has to close, um, you know, because of an emergency or a disaster or some unforeseen situation that there, there may be an opportunity for you to get money back um, that you have lost in terms of sales um, through that closure. So um, some things to think about there. It's, it's really important that you check your insurance coverage um, annually. Um, if not more often, but now is a great time to do that um, in, in readiness for the upcoming season. Um, and, and just in general, as Liliana says, there are risks all around at all times. Um, and the more that we can take these steps to prepare and to feel um, more in control of our environment, the better we'll be able to respond um, when these emergencies happen. So um, if there are any questions about small business aspects, um, please pop them into the chat or come off of mute. But otherwise, we have kind of raced through a lot of information here. Um, and again, thank you for all being here. Um, and Liliana, again, thank you so much for taking the time to, to be with our community and, and to share and remind us of the importance of all of this. Um, and Hugo, gracias a tu. Is that right? <laughs> Thank you, Hugo. <laughs> that was great. All right, everybody, we'll have a good day. Get prepared, get the plan, go fill up your gas tank and water bottles. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>